Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Happy Father's Day. All you men, God bless you. We had a technical glitch there for a while. We'll come back in just a minute. Uh, God bless Microsoft and Apple and all those other people who make our lives so simple. <laughs> Life was better before cell phones. Can I get a witness? Your boss couldn't track you back then. <laughs> now we know where you are all the time. Well, amen. We had a great time in Belize. Cannot thank you enough for your donations. Amen. Your gifts, your love. Every day was unique and phenomenal. We were in schools. We were on the streets. We were in parks. Uh, and everywhere we went, it was hot. Amen. But we decided the group that sweats together sticks together. And we stuck together quite well. But, uh, I mean, it was, uh, it was an interesting, exciting, glorious time in Dangriga, Belize. Uh, the second time we've been there in that city, we were there, I think, in 2009. But it was a glorious time. We started the mornings in school assemblies. We, uh, ladies had a Bible study. Uh, Charity Acker, Laurel Cabrera led that and took care of those ladies. And uh, Again, in, in Belize, it's not like the good old USA. We have air conditioning everywhere. You know, it's pretty much at the hotel room when you get into your room. You get some air conditioning. But so I, I cannot applaud you guys that went uh, long enough or loud enough for your commitment and your... your your passion to press on and get through those hard times and those difficult times. There's a lot we're going to share. Wednesday night we're going to be doing, sharing a lot more. I can't encourage you enough to be here Wednesday night. We'll have some testimonies. We'll have some, some dramas. We'll share a lot more about what went on in that, that, in, in that crusade. So I want to encourage you. Be here. Bring someone with you. It'll bless your life. It'll bless your heart. Our, our people had tremendous uh, revival as well. I had Robbie uh, take a couple of videos from uh, people who were there involved in ministry and stuff. One of them is from a, an associate. He, calls him, he says he's not a pastor. He's a, he calls himself a preaching assistant. But he's an associate pastor at one of the churches and then an, and another pastor from another local assembly. So I don't know what order you have those in, but go ahead and, and start those. If you've got sound to them and all that stuff hooked up on one, two, three, four. Now maximize it. There you go. comes up. I'm going to devote my, myself and my time and my prayer for this crusade. And what are you praying for and expecting this week? Well, I, I, I'm praying and expecting that Dangriga will not be the same again. And we, we are declaring and we are claiming Dangriga for Jesus. And for me, I'm praying for a revival within, within the churches and within ourselves because revival starts within us. And we, we that, that claims to be Christians, we are, the, we are the one that's supposed to make a difference. We are the ambassadors for Christ. And when we misrepresent him, then we give people a different understanding of what Christ means to us. And what have you seen so far? What has the first two days been like? The, the first two days ha have been awesome. Um, Joe has been pouring out his heart. Uh, we have been praying for Joe and for this crusade and for the anointing upon Joe. And I, I, I and I'm grateful for the vision which God has given to to Joe Arms. And um, I, I see I see him really working. I see the Spirit of God moving, and I'm, and he is proclaiming the truth without any shame. And I I, I am so I am so um, delighted. I am I'm, I'm so moved by the Spirit of God and we can feel the presence of God as the worship team worship and as he bring forth his word there is conviction I see conviction among Christians among pastors and among people who have claimed to be Christians and, and, and we see them just coming out and asking God for forgiveness and forget a new beginning a new start with God Love it. thank you brother during each night of the crusade, we'd have also uh, anywhere from 60 to 100 kids that would be, we'd take them out of the service after a little bit of the worship time, and we'd take them over to another area. We'd have a kids crusade led by Matt and other people are involved in our, our different ministries. They did a phenomenal job and a fantastic job. Got one more real short testimony you just want to share, I think, that we took as well. You got that one ready? So were you here all three days? Or? 
I was here Sunday, Monday. No, not Monday. Two days, I think. Two or three days. What did you expect that it would be, and how did it actually turn out? Well, um, I was just expecting anything powerful from God. I was, I was thinking that it was more directly to specific things like um, healing or so forth. But um, when I got here the first night, I loved it because. I like that it, it spoke mainly to people to stop playing around with God okay, and that's the message that I get more than anything else stop playing around with God and be serious about it make up your mind and, and, and get there you know make up your mind to to be a Christian and walk a straight Christian walk um, the first night actually it spoke to me because the message was basically go and tell as a Christian I'm supposed to be out there going telling people about God and I slacked off a bit on doing it and I need to get back on my feet to doing that so I like how the pastor ended his session in terms of asking some questions that will actually make you think and recognize where am I at in my life with God I love that that's how he closed it off and, and brought people in so definitely I enjoyed it a lot I'm looking forward to our next one thank you all right bye Amen. Well, I knew he was shocked if he came expecting a healing service. <laughs> we had one, but on a whole different scale. So uh, it was interesting. We had great crowds every night. Of course, that stadium almost has a tendency to swallow. It's all an outdoor pavilion, basically, is what it is for sports, for basketball. And you can uh, probably play two different, three different games of basketball on those courts at one time. But uh, they did a great job. They put about four or 500 chairs in the bottom. And uh, it take a while for those to fill up because it's hot. All right. And so most people like to filtrate to the sides where the breeze was blowing. Those of you who were not there remember how many gallons of mosquito spray you used, right? Because as soon as the breeze would stop blowing, you know, you could hear the mosquitoes humming around you singing nothing but the blood. <laughs> so they were Christian mosquitoes, but they were out and we didn't want to come back with any of that chicken goonga or Zika or anything else that's going on down there. So we kept slothering each other. And of course, when you're sweating and that's mosquito spray runs down into your eyes and so some of them thought I was being just emotionally stirred I was just burning <laughs> but they were great times in the Lord with the, with the ladies Bible study and the, the, the school assemblies we packed you know most of them they did inside many times we did them outside but you just don't know if you take a room about a, maybe a fourth of this size and stick about two or three hundred kids in there and about this much space for the band and the preaching and the dramas and everything and you know uh, like I say it's just uh, with, the, with the heat. I remember in one school out there where, it was the, where they had the Garifuna Museum and all that, you know. I, I was running some marriage stuff and Matthew was handling a couple of assemblies when I was be busy like that. So, But I went out there to see how things were going because I dropped some people off and went over there. And I walked in there and, it, and man, it was just packed. There'd be 300 kids in that little room with, you know, with our team and everybody just pouring down sweat. And I walked up to the teacher and said, you got 12 fans in the ceiling. What those on? Oh, those don't work. Great. <laughs> so anyway, we got through it all. God blessed it all. We had a lot of people come to know Christ. Many, many, many more rededications. I met with the pastors uh, after that. We went over some things. Also uh, called them the next day. They assured me Friday night, for those who were there, maybe I didn't, you didn't get this. Friday night, all the pastors were getting back together to lay out all those decision cards, recommitments, commitments as well, everything they had information on. And they were going to pray over them together as a group. And then they were going to disseminate those to the churches in different areas of the town where the addresses were and start doing the follow-up immediately, they said. So that's what we like to see when you go in. You want to see those things followed up on. But what a great time. Everybody that went, say amen. amen. Wasn't, it, wasn't it glorious? Some of them are still suffering heat stroke. <laughs> Once they get over the heat stroke, they'll join us for the service. But I want to talk today just briefly to our fathers. And, you know, I know most Father's Day sermons are kind of like this. On Mother's Day, it's you women are the best things. You are so wonderful. You're so sweet. You've done such a great job. We can't make it without you. On Father's Day, it's you, you lousy, sorry men. You need to get up off your backside, get out of your big chair and do something for God and your family. But we're not doing it today. We'll be, we'll be nicer today, okay? But uh, even you might need that, all right? You, you take that little method and you can apply that. But I want to talk to you about reclaiming. 
You know, the importance of reclaiming your lost spiritual uh, inheritance. And it is, we're talking about an inheritance. I don't know, a couple of years ago, there was in the news, I think it was 2014, I remember seeing this article. I kind of tried to scratch a few things from memory from it. But in, in 1940, it talked about in this story that uh, after Paris fell, under Nazi control, uh, the Germans went through all the art museums as, as, as well as they did across all of Europe and they stole precious artworks, you know, and they, they housed them. Many of those uh, made it throughout the world. There's still cases and courts being settled all over the world about some of this artwork being returned. In fact, one of those pieces of art that was st stolen by the Nazis has shown up uh, in recent years. It hangs in the University of Oklahoma in the Fred Jones Jr. Art Museum, Museum of Art. Now, the daughter of its if it's former owner of the actual owner of the painting wants it back. The painting was done by, by an artist, uh, uh, French impressionist named Camille Pissario. And it's called the, uh, the uh, name is shepherd shepherd is bringing in the sheep is painted back in 1886. This family, uh, owned it and it's Nazis stole it when they occupied France. And the daughter's name is Leona Meyer. She's suing OU Oklahoma university for, to recover her painting. Of course, they don't want to give it up. And so there's this big contest that's going on. Uh, whether she's successful in her venture, I don't think that's been yet determined. You know how long the courts carry these things out. There's been recent movies like this, like the Monument Inn, another about another painting, uh, about people trying to reclaim these things that belong to their family. I've seen this kind of thing go on, especially as a pastor, when you see families resolving uh, the wills and inheritance and issues, who gets what and what was left to who and the, uh, how people, sometimes people who love each other very much can go to literally go to court with each other over these, over these, these inheritances. But there's another inheritance I want to talk to you about today. And it's found in, in Genesis chapter 26. And it has to do with Abraham and with his son, Isaac and what he left for Isaac. There was a time uh, uh, that Isaac had to reclaim his inheritance and to, re to get what was given to him. It was an inheritance that consisted in his situation of some very valuable wells and water was an important commodity back then. So let me just look and we have these verses on, in, on, on our screen, starting in verse 15 of Genesis 26. It says, now all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abram his father, the Philistines stopped up by filling them with earth. And then Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us. You're too powerful for us. And Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley Gerar and settled there. And then Isaac dug again the wells of water, which had been dug in the days of his father, Abraham, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the same names which his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found their way of flowing water, the herdsmen of Gerar, they quarreled with the herdsmen of Isaac saying, that water is ours. So he named the well Esek because they contended with him. And then they dug another well and they quarreled over it too. So he named it Sitna. And then he moved, click, get that right. And he moved away from there and dug another well and they didn't quarrel over it. So he named it Rehoboth. For he said, as the last, at last the Lord made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. Then he went up from there to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared to him in the night and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear. I am with you. I will bless you. Multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. So he built an altar there and he called upon the name of the Lord and he pitched his tent there and there Isaac's servants also dug a well. So you see Isaac in this mode where he's going in and unearthing these wells that have been filled up by the Philistines, reclaiming what the enemy had taken from him and restoring those wells and also digging some other wells. You know, as I looked at this, I began to realize and thinking about my, my own inheritance. Uh, didn't come from wealthy family. When mom and dad passed away, there wasn't big chunks of money left, all right? In fact, I, I don't even remember what I got. <laughs> I don't think it had much cash value. It was more memorable value, amen? And, and, and those things are important. But the greatest value that was left were spiritual, was of spiritual value was of incredible, great spiritual battle. I was taught the word of God as a kid. I learned the word of God. I had a mom who lived it before me as an example of what it means to live for Jesus Christ. She made sure that I knew the plan of salvation, made sure that I was, knew what it meant to grow in Christ and have maturity in Christ. I cannot tell you how many hours were invested in my inheritance, in the form of this spiritual inheritance, digging of wells that I still draw from today. 
that leave a lasting legacy. It was a legacy of devotion, a, a legacy of prayer, a legacy of faithfulness. And they have had tremendous, tremendous impact upon my life and the lives of everyone in my family. There were some wells that were dug for me by her. There's some wells that were left behind for me. And some of you may have indeed received a spiritual inheritance. You were blessed to have some, a dad, a mom, a grandparent, an uncle. It might have been a pastor. But somewhere in your past, you can recount somebody that dug some spiritual wells for your life. Most of us have had that. You might not recall it, but it's been done. You're in the kingdom because somebody prayed. You're in the kingdom because somebody shared. You're in this kingdom because somebody thought enough to present the gospel and live the gospel and preach the gospel. There's some wells that have been dug for you as well as everybody else. We don't always see it, but the important thing is we need to learn from this particular lesson is we need to recover what has been lost or what has Satan has tried to steal. When the Philistines saw Isaac they were tremendously jealous of Isaac. They couldn't stand his wealth. I mean, we'll look in a moment, he was, be, he was being blessed by God. So they tried to push him out. And one of the ways they did it was, just as they did with Abraham to push him out, they'd go fill his wells back in to keep them from producing water. He goes back, he redigs the wells. Basically, he's reclaiming the inheritance that was less for him. And I think that's exactly what we have to do. Let me get a little more clarity to it. First of all, about this inheritance, let's say, let's put it this way. It was received. Look at verses 12 through 15. Then Isaac sowed in the land. This is after these wells and redigging wells. And, he, and, the, and, the, and, and in the same year that he sowed in the land, he got a hundredfold blessing out of it. And the Lord blessed him, obviously. And the man waxed great. And he went forward and grew until he became very great. For he had possessions of flocks and herds, a great store of servants. And the Philistines envied him. For all the wells which the father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his fathers, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. They hate this guy. They hate Abraham and anything they can do to hinder the prospect of growth and abundance because of their hatred and because of the envy is exactly what they're doing. So Isaac plants his crops in spite of them and he harvested a hundred times more than what he planted. The scripture says why he had such blessings. He says the Lord had blessed him. He's becoming wealthy. And not only is he becoming wealthy, if you pro process this, his wealth is continuing to grow. He purchased flocks of sheep. He purchased flocks of goats. He had herds of cattle. And as all this is taking place, the Philistines are plotting against him. What do they do? They fill his well with dirt. So what's the big deal about that? The big deal about that is a well was the source of life. A well is where your herds can drink and can be healthy and refreshed so they can create more herds, all right? A well is where you're refreshed. A well is, is, is as valuable to them in that day as, say, oil is valuable to us today. And the Philistines knew this, so they go to the very source of what's been. And again, let me just say, I, am, I cannot even begin to say the gratitude that's in my heart, and I think I express it plenty of times to, to friends and family and even to you, that someone came before me and dug some wells which have provided life for me and have been fruitful for me and have given me tremendous spiritual wealth. I'm blessed. I mean, I, the Bible says as the children of God, we are blessed with every heavenly blessing. But if somebody hadn't dug those wells, I probably wouldn't realize the scope of what God's done. Wells have benefited my life. Now, the question here would be, do you, have a, do you, do you realize who has come before you and has left you an inheritance. And in realizing that, do you realize that your responsibility is to also leave an inheritance that when you leave, they'll see the blessings and receive them as well. I think all too often in the culture that we live in, the culture of get, the culture of gain, the culture of more, the culture of selfishness, which describes the end times. That's what we focus on even for our kids. Oh, we want to make sure they got big house. We'll make sure they have a nice car. Maybe leave them a business, get them some jewelry, stocks, investment. Hey, none of those things matter in eternity. None of those things are what's going to help them stand before God. First and foremost, what we want to do is make sure that our children know the word of God and are secure in the word of God and make them eternally secure. I mean, I've, I do a lot of funerals. Pastor Strickland does a lot of funerals. And many times we sit with a family and we ask them, when a dad has passed on, tell us about dad. Tell us what you remember about dad. Tell us what's important about dad. And they go into a list 
of things like dad was a great guy. Dad was a good man. Dad was a good businessman. Dad worked hard. Dad loved his family. Dad taught me how to hunt. Dad taught me how to fish, you know, and on and on it goes. Dad loved the Aggies or dad was a longhorn or whatever it might be. You know, and, 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 I, and I hope and pray that when I die, that my kids get, go farther, a little a bit further in that explanation that says something like, my dad loved God. He dug some wells for us. I'm still harvesting from those wells what dad did. He taught me about Jesus. He taught me the importance of the word of God. He taught me the importance of prayer. He taught me what prayer was really all about and how to believe God. I think with Abraham, as obvious as a man of faith, those spiritual wells were very clear, which we draw water from even today. So I'm asking about us itself, and I think in Father's Day is a good day to ask this question. Are we digging any wells for our kids? Are we leaving any kind of spiritual inheritance for them? Or have we lost the context of what that really, really means? When you look in the book of Psalms and you read through some of the Psalms, like Psalm 78, Psalm 73, there are portions of Scripture that give clear instructions, not just in Psalms. It's in Proverbs. It's in Genesis. Genesis to Revelation. Constant, constant clarification of the responsibility of one generation to do in that generation what they can do for the glory of God so that it impacts the next generation to come. I am, I am hardened. I mean, I am saddened, not hard, saddened in my heart when I see the, the, this generation doesn't seem to be digging many wells for the next generation. We put a lot of emphasis on the importance of being the best, the popular, the valedictorian, the best athlete, getting before the best coaches. All those things are important in the culture of the world. But listen, we've left off the most important things and the inheritance has to be received, but there has to be something to receive for the inheritance to be received. The second thing I want you to see from this and look at verse 15 is the inheritance was robbed. In verse 15, for all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines, had stopped them and filled them with water. That was always one of the strategies in ancient times was to find the source of water and stop the enemy from getting to it. Whether you clogged up the river, damming it up, or whether you blocked the wells, whatever you cleared the stop the springs it, to stop the water was equivalent to dropping a bomb in our culture. That was the, that was the, what are you doing? You're cutting off the life giving source. The most important of all water. When you shut the water down, you got problems and that that's exactly what they, what, what they did. Now we face an enemy that is far more cunning than the Philistines. We face an enemy that's more cunning than Abimelech and all the Philistines together. The Bible says our enemy walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Maybe you have had some ancestors. Maybe they dug some wells for you. Maybe you're drawing water from those wells, but you can be sure that Satan does not want you to draw from those wells. He'll do everything he can to get you to some state of spiritual dehydration to keep you from being successful. He don't want you to draw from those wells. But there are a lot of wells available to us. But what happens? Satan does everything he can to keep you away from that water, to block that from you, and you literally become spiritually dehydrated. I mean, if you've been to Belize for this before, we always deal with one or two or three cases of dehydration. We always are keeping bottles of waters in, the, in, in everybody's hands from the youth to the adult. Are you drinking water? I'm drinking water. I mean, I'm sure the kids got tired of it. I don't know, I got to drink water. I see him drinking, that's not water. That'll dehydrate you. You need to drink water. You know, caffeine's a diuretic. It'll dehydrate. Drink some water. I don't want water. Drink water. And there's always one or two that get sick and nauseated or dizzy and weak because they're just not drinking enough water. How simple is that? But I want you to know, when you go to Belize on a trip like that, and those who've been there know, you better take at least three shirts for the day, right? Three changes. Because you're going to be wringing out every one of them before the day's over. You're going to go out in the morning, you come back, you're soaking wet. You know? I mean, I, I, one day I just, you know, I, I, I threw a shirt in the corner. The next day I stepped on it and it broke. <laughs> That's how bad it is. It's rough. And you can tell if somebody didn't change the shirt. So you say, get back to the room, get another clean shirt on. Some people didn't realize that how many they go through and had to put a few things. Like Bill Legale had to go to the, the, the hotel cleaners. Can you clean these for me? Because you're going through it. But what happens when you, get, when you get dehydrated? You lose your strength. I mean, you lose your balance. 
You, I mean, you get nauseous. And there's a lot of people who are that way in their spiritual life today. They don't have that stamina. They don't have the courage or the strength because they're not drawn from the waters that have been provided for them. Just as Isaac named the wells, we have some wells that have been named for us. Anybody that ever digs your well and it's a Jesus well and it's a spiritual well, that's a well of joy or a well of peace or a well of hope. These are things we draw on and we draw on because we've seen the reality of it, not just written, but we've seen the reality of it lived in somebody else's life before us. It's time that we build, we reclaim these and we take back what's been stolen from them, whether it's joy or hope or peace. Those wells didn't belong to the Philistines. They belonged to Isaac. They were dug by Abraham. And, but you can't benefit if you don't draw from them. When those Philistines began to fill up those wells, they could have easily, that's it, it's too much trouble. I mean, it's not like, listen, it's not like they had hydraulic equipment to drill these things with. These are dug by hand in deep holes where it's hot and it's miserable and it's backbreaking. Somebody made some sacrifices on your behalf. Somebody had a commitment and some disciplines on your behalf as well as their own. But what it should do, not only are they making commitments, they're making a, a stride for it. They're making a sacrifice and you're benefiting from what some other people did. Well, we experience this on so many levels. We just need to pray, I think, for an, for an attitude of gratitude to help us slow down and see, hey, this has been, we have been blessed. We have been blessed. The worst thing I can do is ignore it. The worst thing I can do is reject the word, reject God. It's not only heartbreaking for those who, who came before and left the well, it's heartbreaking to, to, in, in your own life. So it's time for action. What happens? The well was received, but then it was sought to be robbed by being blocked. But in verse 16, you'll see exactly what needs to happen. It's what Isaac did. And Abimelech said to Isaac, get out of here. Go from us. You're much stronger and mightier than we are. And Isaac departed from that area. I mean, and he pinched his tent, by the way, in the area that belonged to him in Gerar. And he dwelt there and he digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham, his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names at the name which his father had called them. What's he doing? He's reclaiming his inheritance. He's going after what was, what was taken from him. Verse 18 says, Isaac digged the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham. And the Philistines had stopped him. And he went back and he called them by the same names that his father had named them. But here's the thing about it. When you follow the story, you see that Isaac is not only reclaiming and digging those wells. Wherever he goes, he's digging new wells. He's leaving something for somebody else. He reclaims his inheritance. He restores the names to it. And that's not an easy task, all right? It's a hard work. He fought for what belonged to him. He wasn't going to let it go easily. He wasn't going to forfeit what others had sacrificed so much for. Never get to the place you're just willing to walk away from something that is rightfully yours. You're a child of God's kingdom. Victory is yours. Power is yours. Peace is yours. Forgiveness is yours. Grace is yours. The cross is yours. The blood is yours. The word is yours. Don't give those things up. It says he reclaimed them in verse 19. I love this. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdman Gerar just drive and said, well, that water's ours. We read that a while ago. And so they, they dug it anyway and renamed it. And then he digs a new well in verse 24. And it's, and, and verse 22 says, and he removed from there and he digged another well. And they strove not. And he called it the name of Rehoboth and said, for the Lord hath now made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. And he went up from there to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I'm the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not. I am with you. I will bless you. I will multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there and he called upon the name of the Lord and he pitched his tent there. Best place to pitch your tents at the altar. Amen. And Isaac's servants dig the new well. So they're reclaiming wells, but they're also digging new wells. This would be a reminder for the rest of his life that everywhere he went, he's building altars and digging wells. It's a blessing to have some wells that you draw from, but it never stops there. You have a responsibility to dig some wells for the generation that is coming. 
We have to be about that business, especially as men of digging new wells, living the life, being committed, being willing not to live a life of compromise, but to leave a life of legacy. There's no real legacy that you're leaving if what you're saying doesn't match what you're doing. You walk the talk, you live the life, you move forward. It's not going to matter in eternity if your kid was the best ball player on the team. And a lot of parents invest a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money into making their kid the best athlete, the best swimmer, the best volleyball player, whatever it might be. It's not going to matter in eternity if they made valedictorian of their high school. It won't matter if they're most likely to succeed in the yearbook and the annual at the end of the school year. If they're successful in business, what's going to matter? The great fortune that's going to matter is what's been invested in their spiritual life. That they know how to stand in life. They know how to live in life. They know how to resolve issues in their life. I have been blessed. You have been blessed to receive a spiritual inheritance from your spiritual forefathers. They've left a lot of things for us. Perhaps, though, the enemy has been successful in filling up those wells. There have been those who've gone before you who have done great spiritual feats and you're sitting back by watching. Not, no benefit for you are you deriving from those wells because it, you have to dig them. You have to redig them yourself. They're there. They're ready to go. But you're going to have to get in there and make a commitment of your own. You're going to have to make a decision of your own. You're going to have to choose to live for Christ. You're not going to get into heaven because they were spiritual. You're not, not going to get this through spiritual osmosis. You're not going to get it because you're near. All right. You're going to get it because you made a choice and you chose to redig those wells and you guard those wells and you maintain those wells. But you also dig some new wells that you hand down to your children and to your grandchildren and to your great grandchildren. The word today is pretty simple. Reclaim, you know, reclaim what's been stolen. Redig, draw from those wells. They've been laid there for you, but you're going to make a a decision to go get what's been provided for you. But never stop with just receiving. It must move forward into giving. You continue to plant. You begin to continue to pour. You continue to teach. You continue to instruct. The Bible says, while you are in the way with your children. What's that mean? Does that mean that you sit down at nine o'clock every night and have a devotion? Good for you if you do, that's fantastic. But it's while you're in the way of life. When you're at the grocery store, you have an opportunity to teach. When you're at the restaurant today, there's going to be an opportunity to teach something. When you're picking your kids up from school, there's an opportunity. Something's going to happen and you're going to have an opportunity to teach. Something's going to have and work. It's going to be an opportunity to teach. Every, every time you turn around as a parent, there's another opportunity to give a lesson. And it doesn't mean you have to say, well, okay, children, now I'm going to tell you about how we drive in traffic when the idiot in front of us misbehaves. Turn to Ephesians 4, 7. You know, <laughs> it's not like you're opening up a Bible study or pulling off the side of the road. We'll begin with a slight word of prayer. Junior, would you lead us in prayer? That's all right, Susie, you got the offering. No. <laughs> no, it's just it's simple principles of life as you go through life. You're teaching those principles. It's the role of, of, of father to also be priest and professor in their family. That's a role. And that's what it means, I believe, to reclaim your inheritance, but also leave an inheritance behind you. Hallelujah. Now, I'm, I'm not going to give an invitation this morning. I just want every father, grandfather to make their way up to the altar right now. And I'm going to pray with you and for you. Amen.